That's how we know the voice of our parents. If you carry a six-month-old baby, that baby already knows the voice of his mom. How? They have been intimate, isn't it? They have been intimate. So much that if another person tries to fake the voice of the mother, the boy says, no, this is not my mom. He knows his mother because of the intimate relationship. The more you relate with God through the word of God, the more you will hear his voice. The more you will be able to hear his voice. Many of us complain, I don't know how to hear God. How do I know the will of God for my life? How do I still speak to people? With him, in the scriptures, he will begin to speak to you through the word of God. Do you understand that? He speaks, he directs, he guides. That's disciples. When he says, Follow me, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, where will you see him to learn of him? You will see him in the word of God. So study scriptures, read your Bible very well, meditate on what you read every day. Every day, just as you eat every day, read your Bible, feed your soul every day. And pray. Pray. Commit your life to Him, commit your ways to Him every day. You will meet Jesus in the place of prayer. You understand that? Get intimate with Him in the place of prayer every day. He will speak to you, He will instruct you about your life. Also, being with Jesus to learn of him involves participating in Bible study with other Christians. Go for Bible study. Study the scriptures together with other people. Many young people like going to church, but when it comes to Bible study, they will see very few. How do you grow that way? But if you are with disciples in deep, then they will continue with you. Bible study, personal Bible study, fellowship Bible study, you must get intimate with God. And as you hear the Lord teaching and instructing you from His Word, take action. Take practical steps to obey Him. That's how to experience God. God is not difficult. When you get serious with Him, you will get serious with Him. He's been waiting for you. He's been waiting. When you hear God, Touch your heart about the scripture, even as you have been hearing the word of God in this meeting. God has touched you about something. Make a move. Take note of that thing. And quickly, go and obey. You will soon start experiencing God in a new dimension. God is real. Are you hearing me? Our God is real. He's not a dead God, He's living and active. Living, exciting. I'm excited to be a child of God. I'm excited. He manifests himself every day. I'm excited. It's exciting to be a child of God. Don't 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 be dormant with Christ. As you take steps to obey him, you experience him. And you say, oh, even me. So God can even use me. Wow, oh, even me. Yes, even me. But discipleship is the key. Getting intimate with him. Discipleship also involves being with and submitting your life under godly tutors and guardians that God provides for you in order to learn the life of Christ. We have said much about that. So, make sure, as Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 says, that you learn from those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Go to the Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. God has commanded us to learn from such people. Those who through faith and patience, they have experienced God. Those are the people to submit your life under. The time came for Jesus to get into Jerusalem and go into the temple to fulfill prophecy. He's been going to Jerusalem before. Are you getting me? He's been going there. He will try. He will walk on foot. And his disciples will follow him. But 
at this time, it was the time set for a prophecy to be fulfilled. He will not walk on his feet to Jerusalem at this time. He was to ride upon a donkey. Are you getting me? The prophecy that was to be fulfilled is in the is in the book of Zechariah chapter 9. And it was meant to be fulfilled by Christ. So we are told, once he got near Jerusalem to a village called Bethphage, he sent two of his disciples. He said, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Use them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, he shall say, the Lord has to read of them. And immediately, you will send them. The Lord was to ride upon a colt to Jerusalem. Actually, he sent for a donkey and a colt. That means, this donkey was a female, isn't it? And the colt of a donkey is the young of a donkey. Do you understand that? Incidentally, this coat has this, I mean, this donkey has a coat. The she donkey and her baby, a child. The Lord sent for them and said, Go and bring them. I must ride on them into Jerusalem this time in order to fulfill prophecy. Are you following my story? Now, let me just say by, as a side comment. He wants to ride upon not just the she donkey, but together with the goat. It looks to me as if prophecy is about to be fulfilled in South Africa. And the people that the Lord will use mainly are the goats, the young of a donkey, male and female. The Lord has need of you at this time. Prophecy must be fulfilled. God wants to visit South Africa again. He wants to enter into the temple, into his church in South Africa. He will chase out money changers. He will drive away those who are selling those. He will flog them. He has his whip. He has his whip. He will flog them out. But the people that he will ride upon, for him to go and do this, they are the youth. That's why you are so crucial in God's purpose. That's why God is taking time to address you over these issues. The Lord has need of you in this generation. You must not live a careless life any longer. You must be serious with Jesus. So he sent the disciples, go and bring this donkey and her colt. And if anybody dares to challenge you, tell them and say, the Lord has need of you. Whatever it is that wants to hinder you from serving God, there is authority now to challenge such powers and say, the Lord has need of these young people. And they will release you. The donkeys and the colts that God will use to do that must have been tied they are not donkeys that are free rangers. Do you know there are free, there were free rangers, free ranging donkeys in Bedford that time? Because donkeys at that time were used as means of transport. If you want to travel from, um, from Bethel to Jerusalem, you ride on a donkey. Are you getting me? Those were the taxis of their time. So donkeys were many. But the ones that Jesus will use are the donkeys that have been tied. It's not the day he will use them that he will tie them. They must have been tied before. Are you getting me? He said you will find a donkey tied. And he, you know, it amazes me that Jesus knows the address of that donkey. He knew where it was tied because he was part of it. He marked out that donkey for his glory. 
He knew where it was tied, and he sent for that donkey. Go! You will find this donkey tied in a place where two ways met, outside. It is tied somewhere under a tree. He described it to them. Lose them and bring them. It is the time of this donkey that God, that the Lord will ride upon into his temple that we call discipleship. Connecting the donkey and restraining the donkey in order for this donkey to be trained and cared for and brought up in order to fit for the master's use. This is discipleship. Let's look at it. Now, the donkey was tied. I don't know how long the rope is, but it was tied. Do you know that when a donkey is tied, or even any animal, even if it's a goat, the length of the rope determines the circumference of its liberty? Isn't it? The rope is, I mean, the donkey was not free to go anywhere it likes. It will go somewhere, but where it will go depends on the length of the rope. In Christ, we have liberty. Eh? And that's why many young people who are Christians, they want to exercise their liberty. I'm not, I'm not under bondage. Hallelujah. Let me do whatever I like. God has called us to liberty. Fine. But the same scripture still says, make sure you don't use your liberty as an occasion to gratify the desires of the flesh. You have liberty. But to use liberty to gratify the desires of the flesh is already sinful. Cancel. It cancels your liberty. The cult that Jesus will ride upon has liberty. But liberty curtailed. This coat was tied. And again, that means it depended on the caretakers, the, 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 the guardians to meet its needs. You are not understanding me. This coat wants to eat day and night. Do you know, after it must have finished the grass all around the circumference of the rope, when the grass finishes, what happens? It will have to depend on the caretakers to bring it food. A disciple must depend on the Lord and lean on him to provide for his needs. You have parents, fine. They are going to take care of you, good. But when you become a disciple, you don't depend even on your parents. Even when they bring you provisions, you will thank them. Do you understand? They have done a great work, but it's not compulsory that they are the ones that God will use. You must depend on the Lord. This court depended on the caretakers. It depended on the Lord to meet his needs. Whatever they bring to eat, that's what it will eat. If they bring dry grass, what will it eat, please? Dry grass. If they bring fresh grass, what will it eat? Fresh grass. If they bring it water, that's what it will drink. But you know the Lord cares for us, isn't it? The Bible says in First Peter chapter 5, verse 7, Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. So don't be afraid of discipleship. The Lord cares for you. This, this uh, cult, one thing I just want you to note is that it depended solely, completely on the Lord and the person that God has mandated to take care of it. This life of, you know, freelance life, this free-ranging attitude of the youth in our time is not godly. If you are hoping that God is going to use you mightily, if you are hoping that you are going to become a vessel of honor in his hands, this freelance attitude is not correct. The cult that Jesus will ride upon must be tied and, and must be dependent on the Lord. 
Hey, no, 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 I can do it myself. I, w- I want to do it myself. Hey, don't, don't, no, 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 nobody should uh, d- uh, curtail my movement. No, 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 nobody. I want to do it myself, myself, myself. That's the self that will ruin you. Depend on the Lord. Do you know that while this cult was tied, as I said, there were free ranging asses, isn't it? Free ranging donkeys. If you observe donkeys and animals, when they see their friends, they normally go to their friends, isn't it? They flock together. So the free ranging ones must have come to this one that was tied one of the days. I said, ah, I came yesterday, you were tied. I came today, you were tied. Ah, what's wrong with you? Why should you allow them to tie you? God has called us to liberty. Hallelujah. I have liberty. Look, if you keep allowing them to tie you like this, you die of hunger. I'm going, I'm going to greener pastures. And then it will march away and go to greener pastures and eat grass and, you know, go to the stream, eat grass, drink water and come back and show this one the skin. He said, look at my, my dress. Look at my dress that God provided for me. You see, God, I'm a Christian also, but you see, I'm a free ranger. I go to green pastures. You are here tied in the name of disciples. You will not die in poverty. If you understand the language of donkeys, that's what they were saying to this one. Say, cut the rope, cut it. Why should you allow them to tie you? Cut it, cut it. And if you see a goat tied, he always wants to cut the rope, isn't he? <laughs> and the, the other asses, the other donkeys are trying to pressurize him. Peer pressure. Cut the rope. We are Christians also. God is providing for us. I cannot allow my life to be tied like this. And this one will say, don't worry. He who tied me will lose me one day. I'm meant for a purpose. And that's why when God was talking to us about having a vision for your life, it's very crucial. Because peer pressure will want you to cut the rope and get away from the Lord and have your own way. Then you will have no future. You will lose your future. So day after day, this one was tied. These others are free rangers. But do you know those free ranging asses? One of these days, as they are eating grass, they will eat poison. And they will die. But this one that, uh, that is tied, the owner will never give it poison. So, being tied down in discipleship for your training, for your learning, it is for your, it is for your shepherding. So that you won't go and eat poison. There are free rangers among you, free ranging people, young people. They eat here, they eat there, wrong doctrine there, bad doctrine there, false religion, every day. They eat. They eat poison. And before you know it, their faith is overthrown. But the one that has entered into discipleship, as the Lord locates you where he wants to connect you, and you stay there, no matter what you are enduring. One of these days, the day of glory will arrive. The day of glory is coming. You are tied today in discipleship. Fine. You are dependent on the Lord. Good. When others are doing something, God says, you cannot. Others may do it. You cannot. Do you know God does that to his disciples? You see some people behaving anyhow, and they're saying, hallelujah, you see Jesus, we are worshiping, praise the Lord, glory. And it looks as if it's Jesus they are worshiping. But for you, he says, don't do it. And you say, Lord, but why? Why are you so strong on me? Why are you so hard on me? Oh, God, that, that, so that is, is also a Christian. You are not telling that one not to do it. Why me? Why me? It's for your good. As you relate with the Lord in discipleship, He will curtail your movement. He will curtail your liberty. Things that 
others are doing, he will not allow you because he has a great purpose for your life. Don't be like those free rangers. Don't be a free ranger, my sister, my brother. Discipleship curtails your movement. You must be ready for it. So when the day came, the Lord, who knew where he had located this donkey, he sent for it. He said, lose him. It's time to lose him now. And bring him to me. Wow. Again, discipleship, working with Jesus, is for the whole of your life. You don't graduate from discipleship. Are you getting me? But when it comes to tying you, maybe to one person here, one person there, at one stage or the other, and he says, submit under this one, submit under this one, it has a limit. There is a time appointed by the Father when the Father will send for you and say, Lose him and bring him to me. So they went and they brought this, this donkey and her coat. And when they brought the donkey, what happened? We are told. So the disciples did. As Jesus commanded, they brought the donkey and the colt, that's verse 6, verse 7 now. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. Hmm. When they brought the donkey, what happened? They, you know, Peter, Peter, removed his shirt, I don't know how many colors, and put it on the donkey. John, James, they put it on the donkey for Jesus to sit on, on the donkey. Do you understand me? But you see, it was for Jesus. They removed their shirt and put their shirt on the donkey. But who was wearing the shirt? It's the donkey. People will lay down their shirts for Jesus. But you are the one to wear it for Jesus. You know, when God talks about uh, the plans I have towards you, there are plans for prosperity. Even physical prosperity is included. Don't let anybody deceive you and say, if you want to prosper, hallelujah, sow a seed, sow a seed. <laughs> you have not jammed prosperity yet. People will lay down treasures for Christ, but you are the one to use it for. A time of glory is coming for every disciple. That's why you must now bury your head in it. It's not going to be forever under somebody here and there. The Lord who, who, who has you and who knows you, who needs you, will so send for you. So they laid their clothes on the donkey. He sat on the donkey. Then those who had no opportunity to put the, their dresses on the donkey, they put their dresses down. Hmm? Somebody remove his wrapper and put it on the ground. Another person removes his shirt, put it on the ground. Some people cut branches of leaves, put it on the ground. For who? It was for Jesus as he was marching majestically to Jerusalem. They laid it on the road. But let me tell you, as that donkey was carrying Jesus, who was stepping on those red carpets? Is the donkey that was walking on human clothes, red carpet. The time of glory is coming. Don't think discipleship is meant to punish you. It's for your glory. It's for your glory. Carrying the King of Kings, carrying the Lord of Lords in His glory. Oh, people, they were marching forward, dancing here and there. Oh, Zan. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the son of David. Wow, this donkey was enjoying the glory of the Lord. Carrying the king of kings. It was then that the three leaders came around and said, Ah, I wish I am the one. Wow. So, this is what you were preparing for when they tied you. And you didn't tell us. Wow, I wish I'm the one carrying Jesus. But 
Jesus says, I don't use sea rangers. I only use asses, codes that are tied. Discipleship is God's means of time, restricting you for training, for equipping, until you become matured character-wise, and you become equipped for the glorious assignment that God has for you. And when the time of glory comes, wow, a disciple will experience the glory of God. Do you know Peter did not just keep following for nothing? When the time of glory came for Peter, they were going to the temple one day, and then this this creeper, and they said, look, money is not a problem for us. People are giving you money, and you, you are still a creeper. Let's give you what money cannot buy. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Ah, and the cripple of 40 years rose up and walked. What a glorious experience. God has something for you. Beyond what you are experiencing now, and beyond what all those false prophets are dangling around your face, that you are pursuing as if that is prosperity, there is something more to Christianity than all that. And if you want it, I call you to discipleship. Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you. I don't have time now to go into these examples that I listed here. Thank God that even in the morning, our brother touched a bit about Esther that I wanted to really talk about today. It's not in the list, but, you know, you can study. People that went through God's disciplinary dealings, People who followed him, they followed hard after him. They suffered a bit. Eh? They suffered. Just like that ass that was tied. He couldn't go freely to eat green grass and do anything it likes. But he didn't die. It was part of the trading. Study these examples. You will see that even the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what amused me most. That Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, who did not even need to go through discipleship, he was already perfect. Are you getting me? He was already holy. He knew no sin. He was already anointed with the Holy Spirit without measure. He didn't even need it. But for him to show us the way, the proper way to live and to follow God, he, he, he went down and submitted himself under the tutelage of his mother. Galatians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, Even so Jesus, made of a woman, made under the law, he also was molded. He submitted to the molding hands of his mother, of his father, his foster father. If you read, you know, the Gospels, you will discover where his mother exercised authority over him, his father as well. Do you remember when they were going to Jerusalem to worship at the Passover and Jesus remained at the ten temple while they went back home? And on the way, they remembered that they have missed him. They went back looking for him. Luke chapter 2. Do you remember the story? The Bible says, when they found him at the temple and they said, Son, why have you treated us like this? He said, ah, don't you know I must be about my father's business? Now, even though he must be about his father's business, discipleship is still the way. What happened? We are told he followed them. He went down to Nazareth with them, and he was subject to them. That's discipleship. And from that age 12, to age 30, when he eventually entered into ministry, he was under their tutelage. In the book of uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 3, Jesus was referred to as the carpenter. Not just the carpenter's son. They say, is this not the carpenter? Don't we know his brothers and sisters? Is this not the carpenter? That told me that between age 12 and 30, while he was under the tutelage of his parents, he learned carpentry. It's part of discipleship. Discipleship is a whole life training. 
physical and spiritual. It takes care of every part of your training. To nurture you and direct and guide you to the right purpose of God for your life. He learned carpentry. He was called a carpenter. He learned a trade. He was too taught. You can imagine. Mary, one of these days, saying, Jesus, yes, ma'am. Go and fetch water for me. Ah, I need to make uh, food for you people. And he will go and fetch water. That's part of the tutelage. Some of you have overgrown tutelage. Erroneously. Parents can no longer send you. Even your godly parents can no longer talk to you. You are missing something. You are missing something. Even Jesus will not do that. It's part of your discipleship to be obedient and submissive under your parents. And when you have proved your obedience, God may then move you under another hand, if he likes, to move you further in discipleship as God moved Jesus under John the Baptist who baptized him and he learned even the message of John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 17, the first message Jesus preached, it was John that first preached it. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He learned it on that job. That's discipleship. So if Jesus, the king of kings, the lord of lords, went through discipleship, what do we say about you? Discipleship is the key unto entering into God's purpose for your life. It was as Jesus proved himself obedient like this that the Spirit of God came upon him without measure. And then he accomplished all that he accomplished for, for God. So the issue of discipleship cannot be overemphasized. You are saved, we praise God. But you must go on with God, working intimately with Jesus. Be serious in your faith. You must submit yourself under tutors. You are an heir, but the heir must be put under tutors. Under guardians, what we call disciples. Until the time appointed by the Father. You must put yourself under this training in order to receive God's disciplinary dealings. So that your life will be correct, equipped for the purpose of God that lies ahead of you. So in conclusion, the Lord Jesus has been waiting for you all this while to make you and to expose you to divine experiences that will usher you into your glorious inheritance. He says, follow me and I will make you. And he says, put my yoke upon you and learn of me. Discipleship is God's own method of making his vessels, those he will use for his glorious purposes. And it is good that a man should bear this yoke of discipleship in the days of his youth. This is the right time to respond to God's call unto discipleship so as to lay a solid foundation for your future. I pray that you will respond appropriately to the voice of him who speaks to you from heaven even now, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, what will you say to all this? I think we need to respond to God before we take questions. You may have questions, but you have had it. You have, you have had God speak to your heart. And this same Jesus, he says to you, he says, follow me. Follow me, you, even you, follow me, I'll make you. That's the only way into God's purpose for your life. Follow me. I will make you. I will make you. Make up your mind to, to follow. Make up your mind to begin to be serious with God. Make up your mind. He says, do you want to be my disciple? Then you must say no to yourself. Take up your cross daily. Follow me. Whatever it is that seems to want to be a hindrance, until you're following in discipleship, you will throw it away today and respond to the Lord. Because He calls you. And it's not tomorrow He will get your response. Whatever your response is today will determine what happens to you tomorrow. Because God will not speak into the air. He's speaking to you. Will you respond and say, Lord, 
I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Make me your disciple. Tie me, tie me under the tree of your choice. Connect me with the guardian of your choice for my life. Since you say you want to use the coats of a donkey, I am available. Tie me, Lord. Whatever be tied, I know you love me better. I know you will not pass me by in the day of glory. I don't want to be a free ranger, Lord. What have I gained being a free ranger? Lord, tie me to the tree of your choice. I want to follow you. I want to learn of you. I want to be your disciple. Would you like to pray this afternoon? Let's stand up to pray. Please make a definite commitment to the Lord at this point. You have had him over this matter of discipleship. He is God's only way of making vessels for his use. There are believers who are free rangers, but they will never be qualified for God's glorious use. Will you please pray, Lord, I'm available. Please, I want to follow you. I want to be your disciple indeed. Lord, tie me to any tutor of your choice. Lord, help me to follow you to the end. Help me, help me to be qualified to become one of those asses, one of those donkeys you will ride upon into your Jerusalem, into the temple in our time. Lord, make me such a vessel in your hand. For first time, do whatever you want to do. Every disciplinary measures, dealings that you want to grant me, Lord, do it. Feel free, Lord. I'm available. I'm available. Please pray. Speak to God for your life. Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word which is his comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter his word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703-036359, 0703-768118. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Daniel chapter 1 um, I bring you from verse 18. Let me confirm it. Uh, chapter 1. Let me begin from verse 17. To these four young men, God, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And if I could read just a commentary, someone says, Daniel and his friends mastered the Babylonian literature on astrology and divination by dreams. And then it continues to talk about the kind of subjects uh, that were offered in Babylon uh, in those days. And they included science and mathematics and so forth. And we are told that uh, they excelled. Then verse 18 tells us, at the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them 
who had met that Nazar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. The impression I'm getting here is that these young men were actually examined by the king himself. And when he examined them, he found that they out excelled uh, their peers in Babylon. First one says, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king himself questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the enchanters in his whole kingdom. Have you noticed in verse 17 that their excellence is actually ascribed to God himself? We are told that God himself helped them to excel. So this proves that God is interested in us excelling as God's children. It brings him honor and glory when we as students in our universities are doing exceptionally well. And it is a stigma, as it were, if we are God's children and we are not doing well at all. Now let me just mention very briefly that when we read the scriptures, there is an association between character and excellence, between your life and excellence. There is an association between the two. If your life is correct before God, you are living a life that pleases God, you are walking with God, and God himself is the one who is guiding you, he is the one who is helping you, even with your academic work, then you will excel. And as you excel, you give honor and glory to God, acknowledging that he is the one that has helped you. There is a connection between how you live and your academic work. If you remember, Brother Billy alluded to it briefly when he talked about uh, your, pre your preoccupation with someone else and your studies. You remember? He alluded to it. He talked about how if you are in love with someone else, and while you are studying, something disturbs you, and you refrain from your studies, and you look at the picture of your boyfriend, or the picture of your girlfriend, and you begin to meditate on him, rather than your studies. How that, that could be a distraction, which would make it difficult for you when you go back to your studies to begin to grasp the way you were grasping before. I've been teaching at university. Sometimes we notice how that students are doing exceptionally well in their studies, and all of a sudden their work begins to noticeably decline. Then we wonder, we say, this student naturally is a brilliant student and is a student that has been doing very well. Why is it now that this student, all of a sudden, has just skipped, has just declined in his or her performance? And when we begin to investigate why there's a decline in the student's life, we inevitably discover that there are other things that are interrupt, interrupting the student's performance. Either it is the situation at work, uh, or the student uh, has started now to be involved in other uh, issues 
in love relationships which are causing a distraction. What I'm saying is that uh, there is a connection between your character, between your relationship with the Lord and your performance. If your character is correct and you are living a life that pleases God, you are intimate with Him, you are able to discuss anything and everything with Him, including your academic work. You will realize that God will begin to help you and your performance will drastically improve. May I tell you that also discipleship is very helpful, not only in your work with God. Discipleship is interested in the totality of your life. When you are a disciple, and there is someone that, Lord, that the Lord has placed over your life to guide you and to be keenly interested in your life, that person will also be interested in how you are performing in your schoolwork. And when there are difficulties, there's someone who will counsel you, someone who will guide you, someone who will help you uh, to do well in your studies. So discipleship has innumerable advantages when you are a disciple. And one of them is receiving academic guidance and academic work as a child of God. So God is interested in your success. Now the topic combines academic excellence with career guidance. It combines the two. And I want to suggest to you that maybe career guidance precedes uh, academic excellence. I'll explain why I'm saying that. In discipleship, we are teaching you that in life you want to fulfill God's purpose for your life. So when it comes to your career choice, you are not being guided in the way in which psychologists who will subject you to all kinds of tests, psychometric tests, and other kinds of tests in order to determine how to determine what line of study you must pursue. If you are a child of God, the kind of guidance you are going to give you will deal with God's purpose for your life. We will need to find out why did God create you? What is it that God wants to achieve through you? What is God's calling on your life? What is it that God wants to do through you? And then we now guide you in the choice of your career in a manner that is aligned to God's purpose for your life, to God's calling on you. Before I understood what I now understand. Do you know how I used to guide people when they came to me for career guidance? Number one, I would uh, look at the areas in which they excel. I would determine whether they are good in science, uh, they are good in mathematics, 
uh, they are good in that subject and, 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 and that subject. And then already I would know that if you are good in this subject, in these subjects, then the line that is suitable for you are, are these courses. Without any recourse to God, without finding out wh what God wants to do with you. And sometimes when we guide people in, in, uh, in academics, we also look at uh, what careers pay a lot of money. So if you are good in science and mathematics, and you could do medicine, and you could also good, could do teaching, obviously we would say it's better for you to become a doctor. Because if you are a doctor, you will earn more money. If you are a doctor, you will be more respected in society uh, as compared to being a teacher. But now, the kind of guidance we give is the guidance that aligns your career pursuit to what God has called you to do. So the first thing that we would need to do is, what is God's calling on your life? What is it that God wants to do through you? And once we discover what God wants to do through you, and then we guide you in the, in the line that is aligned to God's calling for your life. The advantage with that is that when you choose a career that prepares you to do what God has called you to do, you know that God is on your side. God is going to be helping you. Because God himself is interested in your success and in your excelling in the line that prepares you for what God has called you to do. There's a verse that I want to read in Jeremiah chapter 1. A verse that we know very well. Jeremiah uh, chapter 1. Um, we'll begin from verse 4. Jeremiah 1 verse 4 says, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Then he goes on to explain then the response of Jeremiah to what God had said and God's encouragement to Jeremiah. My interest is not in the whole conversation between Jeremiah and the Lord. But I want you to know that the Bible says before Jeremiah was actually formed in the womb of his mother, the Lord himself had a direction for his life. God himself had an appointment for him. He knew that what he wanted to do with his life. And as he was growing up, his responsibility was to discover what God wanted him uh, to do. Now, I want you to know that the same applies to you. That when your mother conceived you, and your conception was not a mistake, God determined that you would be conceived and born. And God at that time already knew what he wanted to do through you. And in a sense, he appointed you for what he wanted you to do. And once you discover then what God wants you to do, 
and you begin to align your studies with God's purpose for your life, you'll be amazed how that you will actually do well. The Lord Himself will help you. He will never even direct you in a line for which He has not equipped you. When He directs you uh, in a certain way, academically, it is because He has already given you the equipping that is necessary, that is required for you to do well in that particular uh, direction. There's another verse in Jeremiah 29, uh, verse 11, a verse that we know very well. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And there's just one little thing that I want you to note there in Jeremiah 29, and in verse 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Let me tell you the way we sometimes misinterpret this verse. Sometimes when you read this verse, we read it this way. You say, I, I know, this is me speaking, I know the plans I have for me. Not the plans that God has for me, but my own personal plans that I have uh, for my life which I impose on God, and I expect God to prosper my own plans for my own life, and not God's, God's plans for my life. But this verse says, I know, this is God speaking, I know the plans that I, God, I have for your life. So that the planning, your academic planning, should not be your own planning for your own life. But rather, it should be God planning for you what He wants you, what He wants to do through you. It is the plans that the Lord has for your life that the Lord will prosper, that the Lord will enable you to succeed in. Because it is His plans for your own life the very thing that God created you to accomplish for Him. Once you discover God's plan for your life, and you are clear that this is what God wants me to do, that God will begin to direct you in what He wants you uh, to do. So what is important then is for you to know God's purpose. It's for you, know, for you to know God's calling. And for your life. This is now where the issue of discipling comes in. When you are a disciple and there is a person who is interested in helping you to become the best that God meant you to be, then your counselor is going to be prayerfully, prayerfully talking with you guiding you and showing, discerning with you what God's calling is on your life. And then you'll begin to pursue what God wanted you to pursue. And the Lord will be on your side. And you'll become very uh, successful. And you will excel. There's a young man I knew who studied at the university of Fort Hill. He was the first one in his family, and he had two siblings that were coming after him. And this young man repeatedly, repeatedly failed his first year. 
and he was exceptionally brilliant, very articulate, very active in Christian uh, students' movement, but he was not passing. I think he failed his first year three times. And his younger siblings were excelling. The sister who came after him was maybe now in his fourth year pursuing medicine. And the younger brother was also doing very well. And he himself was not doing well. After his third year, he got counseling. He got a uh, he got guidance, spiritual guidance. Someone prayed with him. Someone discovered, tried to discover what his call, God's calling was on his life. And when he changed, and he took another course of study, that was in line with what God had called him to do. And it was evident in the things he was doing. But for some reason, he was studying something that was not related in what he was doing in the, area, in the areas in which God was using him. When he began to align his studies with what we sense God had called him to do, he did exceptionally well. He started passing and passing with good grades, and not failing any, not repeating any year. Within a, a short time, he finished his degree, and he went for uh, senior degrees, and as I'm telling you now, he's doing very, very well. Uh, in a job that is related to God's work, he works for SOS, you have seen SOS, and he has made some progress. So it is very critical for you to be guided to discover what God's plans, God's purpose, God's intention for your life is, and then begin to align your career pursuit with God's calling, and you will see uh, progress in your studies. Then the last thing that I want to say because of time, um, I want to, allude to the fact that your career must also contribute to the extension of God's kingdom. Your career must contribute to bringing the reign of Christ on earth, the reign of righteousness, the reign of, uh, I mean, the rule of Christ on earth. There's a scripture that I want to just to allude to, maybe two scriptures, and then we will uh, bring this to a close. It is Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Genesis chapter 1, 28. 26 talks about the fact that God created us in his image and in his likeness. And then verse 28 begins to articulate the reason why God created human beings. Uh, verse 28 says, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And Psalm chapter 8, 
Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8. Give me a chance, I'm preparing that. Says, Uh, 8, verse uh, 4. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crown him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. You made him ruler over the works of your hands, and you put everything under his feet. Please allow me to refer to one more scripture and then comment, and then we'll open it up to discussion. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life? I wish you could underline the word reign in life. Reign in life through the man, Jesus Christ. What we are getting from all these scriptures is that God created us to establish the rulership of God on earth. To establish the rulership of God on earth. And as the world that speaks of subduing, God created us to subdue unrighteousness and to make sure that righteousness reigns wherever the Lord has deployed us. Now, this now then relates even to your career. Maybe the Lord may choose you to become a teacher so that in the school where God deploys you, he will want righteousness to reign and wickedness to be subdued through you for you to reign for him and not to reign after death when you have gone to heaven, but to actually reign in life where God has deployed you. God's purpose is that you must know his will for your life. You must know his calling for you. You must know the reason why God created you. Why are you in existence? Why did God bring you to, to, into existence? What is it that God intended to achieve through you? How then must you prepare yourself academically in order for you to realize God's calling for you? So that God can, God can sovereignly then deploy you in a place where he would want to reign through you. This is very, very important. Let me conclude uh, by reminding the sequence that I'm seeing. I think that the first thing that is important for you Number one is for you to have a personal, intimate, 
relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are not born again, for you to be born again, in order for you to begin to discover God's will for your life after you have had a relationship with him. The second thing that is important, after you have established a very intimate and close relationship with God, which begins with you being born again, and then with you walking very closely with the Lord, listening to him, discerning God's will for your life, is for you to discover his purpose for your life, for you to discover his, his calling on you. That is the second thing that is important. And then the third thing that is important is for you then to discover under God and where it is possible with people guiding you to discover which career line will be aligned with God's calling on your life. And you begin to choose a career that will enable you to fulfill God's calling on your life. And then God will help you uh, to excel in what you do. We don't want to give an impression that you will excel without hard work. We couldn't give that impression. Everybody that has, has, has excelled had to work very hard, isn't it? There is no substitute for hard work. Uh, if we had time, we would be teaching you some very effective study skills that would help you to excel. But it is not to be over-spiritual to pray for your academic work before you read your studies, before you approach your books, to ask God to actually assist you in your studies. I have told you that God is interested in you excelling. While you are working very hard, you are also communing with God. You are also conversing with God. You are also asking God to assist you and to help you in your studies. And God will be able to help you because he knows that you are doing what he wants you to do. And he is preparing you for something that he wants to use you for when you finish your studies. I pray that the Lord will uh, help us to understand these few uh, thoughts uh, that we have shared with you, and the Lord will uh, begin to help you uh, to do well in your studies. But I must tell you that sometimes it m you may require to change what you are already doing. Some of you have already started talking to me that uh, you are experiencing some difficulties. You have been doing uh, a course of study for many years and uh, you are not doing well at all. And uh, the question is, are you doing what God wants you to do? Or are you doing what people have told you to do? Or are you doing what you think is going to give you more money? Are you doing what you think is more prestigious? Uh, is going to make you more recognized? Uh, you may have to change your course of study uh, and align it to God's will. And when you begin to do that, it would not be a waste of time. You would find yourself accelerating in your studies because you are doing what God actually always wanted you to do. And when you begin to do what God wants you to do, 
which is in line with what God intends you to do, to use you for, you'll find yourself doing very well uh, in your studies. Again, let me repeat, God is interested in you excelling in your studies. You don't bring any glory to God when you are not doing well. God wants to help you. God wants you, wants you to excel. And that excellence must not be for your own glory. That excellence must be for, for his own glory. Thank you. Let's pray together, just for a minute, and then we will, if we have time, get some interactions. Father, we sometimes stumble when we want to explain uh, things that are very, very important. Our hearts are very heavy when we think of these young people. You have, as it were, loaned us these young people for this weekend. And we carry a very heavy burden of responsibility for these lives that you have so graciously loaned to us. Our hearts go out to them. We really wish that we could, if it were possible, talk to each one of them and guide them to become the stars that we told you yesterday you wished us to be. We wish that we could become the victors and the captains that you have purposed and ordained us to be. In our stumbling, in our struggling to explain sometimes the truth, please, Lord, have mercy and begin to explain to your, uh, to these young people beyond our words. Oh, Lord, we pray that each one of them will find a sense of direction in life. How we pray that uh, they might even begin to find people who will talk to them one-on-one, -on -one. people to whom they will submit, people appointed by God to guide them in every area of their life in a discipleship relationship. Oh, Lord, if that could happen, and then they begin to see progress, in their academic work. And you begin to place them strategically where you are shooting them as arrows to, become, to begin to be the salt and the light that we're told we're meant to be. How happy your heart would be. How happy we would be ourselves. And how fulfilled they would be when they would be doing your will. Father, please take these little words and begin to explain them in, wa in ways that go beyond our feebly attempts to help uh, these young people. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We ask all these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. We want to thank God who is showing this interest in our lives. We are so grateful to God. As I was listening to the presentation, uh, something came out in my heart that I need to share with you briefly before we take your contributions. Maybe it's part of my experience. I think for me, to work for God or to be used by God, it was not very clear that God can use me wherever except inside the church halls, the church walls. Am I clear? I used to think that for God to use me, I, I have to, to, to resign my job. If I was a student, I need to resign and go and preach. That was what was happening in my environment. But now I'm so grateful that God is changing that. God is saying to us today, He is not only interested in using us in pulpits, 
But God wants us to excel in our profession and in our careers. This is the comment that I wanted to make. And I think most of us have the same because in our education, most of the time we don't we don't involve God in our education. We think our education is something that we do for ourselves, for our enrichment, for our benefit. Hans Prof said that sometimes we do choose careers so that we can be recognized in the society, so that we can get money. But today God is explaining to us that He is interested in our education as well. God wants to see scientists with the life of Christ. God wants to see teachers with the life of Christ. God wants to see lawyers with the life of Christ. God wants to see us in our, in our studies showing the life of Christ. So this is what came to my mind as this presentation was given here. But for me now, I'm just going to coordinate. I'm going to open a slot for questions, maybe a point of discussion, maybe a point of clarity. Uh, we don't have time. We have about 15 minutes. So we'll try to be brief. I'll give maybe three people at first. Then you, if you have something to share, a question or a comment, then you will raise up your hand, then the mic. Somebody is going to bring a mic to you so that you say your question or a comment. Um, I just want to ask, since you're talking about aligning our degrees with God's plan, how do we know you, what the degree you're doing is ali with alignment with God's plan? Because I'm doing IS and management, and I'm trying to, well, in management, it can make sense to align, like to do God's work being a manager, but I can't think of anything with regards to IS. Thank you. Let's take all the questions, then we will give one of our elders to, to come and make comments. Hallelujah. Okay, my name is Peter. Uh, I just studied uh, physical metallurgy at Van University of Technology. So what's happening to my life now, like, I'm working, but I'm not interested on in what I'm doing at the moment. So what's happening? Um, when you talk, like, now, I'm in a process of resigning from work. Like, this is coming from the inner person that is living in me. Like, I was thinking of leaving the job, but I'm going, like, what is it that I will be doing? I don't know. Like, uh, I've studied, I finished uh, 2007, so at the moment I'm in the process of studying uh, uh, electro, uh, uh, what's, what's this course? Uh, hmm, it's a uh, instrumentation. So what's happening is, I don't know, like, must I continue with this or must I ask the Lord maybe to help me to choose uh, something that will be relevant uh, to my career or something? Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, does it have to, depends on the level of your failure rate, then you see that this career is not for you. Does it depend on that? Maybe you might be passing, but maybe the career is not for you. So really, how does God show you that this career is for you? Let's say you're not failing or something. Well, 50-50 both sides and also the failing parts. <laughs> I'll make a comment before I give one of my elders. But I think what is, what is emphasized most here is that one needs to discover the plans of God for his or her life. It was emphasized. Of course, as I said, we, we tend not to include God in our education. For us, God is someone that we, 
we may allow to work in our lives when we are in the church, but in our studies, we don't involve God. Okay, I'll give, I'll give Sir to come and praise the Lord. Yes, um, there are two questions that I've been recording. And the two questions I'd like to say, you're simply saying, how do I know what God wants me to do with my life? That possibly is the first question that is recurrent in what we have been saying. Uh, I may I say that let's first of all know that as soon as you become a child of God, God has a plan for you. Say, I know the plans that I have for you. They are plans for good and not for disaster. God is not planning disaster for you. And because what God has in mind for you is for good, you don't need to be afraid to find out. But in finding out the will of God, there are a few things that we need to exclude. First, whereas God may never lead you into something that he does not give you a residual capacity for. In everything that God will lead you to do, if you look inside, there is something that God has deposited in you that will make it possible for you to do it. Secondly, God does not force you to do something that you are not willing to do. He may persuade you. So, we cannot rule out your interest. We cannot rule out your ability or what I call your endowment. Endowment like your talents, your special ability, Areas, what I call areas of your least, of your least struggle. Let's imagine that we want to determine what can you do well. There is something that you do effortlessly. There is something that you have to struggle before you can do. Now, before we start finding out what else, will God have me do? We must look at those areas of your least, your least resistance. Things you do effortlessly. Now, those things that you do effortlessly, that you have innate capacity to do, God did not put those things there to be wasted. They are definitely going to be useful. Is that okay? So, first and foremost, if we remove ambition just to make money or ambition just to make a big name, now when we look at where is your passion, something that God has dropped in your heart that you really love doing, something you wake up in the middle of the night, you feel like doing, something that when you're about to sleep, you find that it's the thing that you'd like to do, God may not be leading you away from it. That's one. The second thing we need to now see is to find out. In this thing that I have capacity to do, how can I best employ it for the kingdom of God? Like now, uh, this man is a teacher, isn't it? You're a teacher? Now, as a teacher, you love to teach. You love to teach, isn't it? You really love to teach. And when you are teaching, you are finding a release inside of you, a fulfillment inside of you, even though there's not much money there. Now, that's one thing. The second thing is now to discover that in that teaching, there is opportunity for you to serve God and do something for the lives of younger people that you will have impacted in, in preparing for the future. And when you have accepted what you are doing, that it will be a channel of serving God, then you will start seeing opportunities 
in your workplace that will give you uh, uh, what I call vents. It will give you outlets of fulfilling the will of God for your life. The young man that is talking of resigning, can I beg you, don't resign yet. Eh? Don't resign yet. If you have not resigned, do not yet resign. Don't leave what you are doing until you know, until you know where you are going. Since you are not yet Abraham, you know Abraham, the Lord told him, rise up, leave your father, leave your mother, leave your country, and go to a land that I will show you. Since God had not said that to you yet, you are only being frustrated. And I beg you right now, don't resign yet. Is that all right? And while I say you should not resign yet, let's find out what next are you to step into. Now, let's agree together that some of you read a course that is like a dungeon. Some of you read courses that were like a dungeon. That has, there's no job for it. There is no application for it. You just read it because you just want to read. Now, you have now entered to the end of everything. There's nothing to do with it. Now, let me say, you are, you are too young to be managing about. You can retrain. Is that okay? You can do what? Retrain. You are not too old to retrain. Does any of you want to live for another 20 years before you die? Let me see your hand up. Who wants to live at least for another 20 years before you go? You want something more than that? <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. Now, listen. Listen. If you hope, by the grace of God, for another 20 years, then it's not too late to prepare today for a 20-year project. Are you hearing me? So, I don't see any problem. You can, you can retrain, actually. You can now look at what area have you not discovered that you would like to excel in? Go and train for yourself. Go and train yourself in it. While you are praying and saying, God, please guide me, you will soon discover that you are taking a new course. Don't mind other young people as, ah, but you have a degree first. Why are you taking another degree? It's their business. When you have excelled, they will meet you up there. They say, ah, we didn't know what he was doing. Retrain. If your former training is only leading you to a cave, you are too young to enter a cave now. Tell somebody, don't enter a cave at, at a young age. Yes, yes. You can retrain. And you see, your retraining is going to give you a, a ventilation that will bring freshness onto your life. Uh, when we go a little further, we'll be talking. Our brother has suggested something to you which I want you to note. Part of discipleship is not just about Bible. It's the totality of your personality. <laughs> and if somebody is already watching your growth and your capacity where you can lean, they might have insight in guiding you properly into what you need to do and do it well. Because time has finished. Now, one last sister said, how do you know that you are doing a wrong course? Is it your failure rate? Or your performance? Uh, yes. Whereas failure rate may be a point. The truth of the matter is that some of you started having failures. Not because you don't have capacity to make it. It's because you are just lazy. You see, a lazy person will never discover his capacity. A lazy person does not exercise his muscle. So you will not know what to carry because you are too, you are too indolent to, to bring forth. So let me first challenge you that even if you are going to change a course, don't let it be failure that chase you out of that course. I don't like you to have the record of dropout. Are you hearing me? 
don't let them label you as a this girl could have been a lawyer, but because she couldn't make it, she's now doing a, a, a PhD. She's now doing physical exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you see, to be a physical educationist will have been great. But don't let it be that they say it's a dropout. That's how he went there. Because when you now went to a place where they regard you as a, a dropout and they dump you there, forever you'll be regretting and say, I could have been a lawyer. It's because one lecturer frustrated me. No! Wake up! And ask God, Lord, you gave Daniel wisdom. Release wisdom for me. I want to hear you by your excitement. Can we agree together that by the grace of God, you know, there's something we couldn't do today about dealing with academic excellence because of time. We will have dealt with progressive study. Some of you, you don't read every week. When exam remains one week, then you put your leg in cold water, <laughs> and then you drink a lot of mescape, and you are now you are now permutating and say, Father, show me the question that will come out in the name of Jesus. <laughs> no, that's not how to excel at all. That is what I call academic gambling. Now, I want you to know now that if school resumes, for example, the first week, as soon as you drop your bag in the hostel, the next day I must see you in the library as a normal way of life. Spend two hours just, just browsing through your books. What you are doing is that you are recycling yourself into academic, what I call academic habitat. When you went home, you went home and you are relaxing. You need one week to come back to academic, isn't it? So you start, you start warming yourself. And you read every week, every day. Do an assignment for yourself. Even when the lecturer did not give you assignment, set an assignment for yourself. What you are doing? Wow, these guys. They say, ah, ah. When you do that, you will have been setting yourself for excellence. You know what we call cumulative grade point average? Are you familiar with it? That determines whether you are going to be a second class upper or first class. And all of these, we have a way of calculating it. We will be dealing with that at another point. Praise the Lord. Let me see all those that are trusting God that they will be captains of their profession, professors of their discipline. Let me see you wave your hand and say, by the grace of God, I will. By the grace of God, I will. Hallelujah. Can I tell you why? I need some of you to begin to take critical space in South Africa. I'm hoping that in another 10, 15 years, some of you sitting before me now, you will have become professors if you are in academics. You will have become not just ordinary lawyers, you will have become um, uh, high court judges, great justices, determining issues over this country. That if white men came around and they are behaving as if they are the monopolies of their knowledge, uh, they will soon get to know that you are not a put around. God will make you say in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah! Now, let me pray for you. Let's pray together. Father, we know it's a crime for anything that connects with your name 
not to be excellent. Your name itself is excellent. All your works are perfect. When any man works with you, he said it shall be heard and not tail. Lord, I want to stand on behalf of my brothers and sisters that anything mediocrity will bind it in the name of Jesus Christ. Anything like being dropped out, we refuse it concerning them. From this afternoon, we are agreeing together that we will hear great things that you are doing by their lives. Each one of them, they will blaze the trail in their profession, in their area of studies, on their campuses, and when they have graduated, thank you that you will do it. And they will do this to extend the kingdom of God in this nation and in other nations. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus Christ's name, we are prayed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 0363659, 0703 Seven six eight one one nine eight. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Let me begin by telling you a story which some of you may have heard before, but even if you haven't it, you will see the value of the story. A man and his wife have lived together for many years until they became very old. And eventually, um, when they were in their 70s, 80s, the man died. And he left behind a wife that was very lonely and a wife that was missing her husband. Now they have children, they have grandchildren, but all their children were in different places. They were really grown-ups and they are busy. And um, none of them could carry the mother to come and stay with them. So each time they called grandma on the phone, how are you doing? Oh, I miss my husband. The house is so lonely. There's nobody to talk with. So one day the children got together and said, how do we solve grandma's problem? And they decided, let's send her something to keep her company. But they did not tell grandma what they were doing. They just sent a very nice package to grandma. And what did they send to grandma? They got this beautiful bird called the parrot. How many of you know the parrot? What does he do? He talks. He repeats everything you say to it, so it's going to be nice company for grandma. But then they just sent a note. Grandma, uh, this is with love from your children. Grandma received this bird, beautiful bird. And she took one look at it. Oh, this bird is going to be sweet to eat. And she took the bird, slaughtered it, uh, and put some pepper and salt on it, and sent it into the oven. And you know, nice seasoning. And then when she finished, she sat down with it and had a good meal. 
Then in the evening, the oldest of the children called, Grandma, did you, did you get the package we sent to you? He said, oh, you are lovely kids. It was delicious. Grandma, what did you say? Very delicious. I had a good time eating it. I took it with tea. It was really good. Grandma, you did what? You ate the bird? Say yes. What else did you send it to me for? No, Grandma. That bird costs so, 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 dollars. That bird is a specially trained bird. It's supposed to talk with you. It's supposed to solve the problem of your loneliness. He said, but you never told me. I took one look at the bird, and it was good for food. So I did what? I ate it. Now, when the proper use of anything is not known, abuse is inevitable. When you don't know the correct use of anything, I was just sitting down as we were talking about marriage and all the questions that have been coming. And I, the pain that is going on in my mind is this is a matter of a misunderstanding. An understanding is missing. These people don't know what marriage is all about. Now, I'm not talking about marriage. I want to talk about ICT. I want to talk about IT. I'm told you call it IT here. Yeah which means the use of technology, the use of internet, the use of computers, the use of cell phones, your iPod, your iPad, anything that is technology. Now, if you don't know the proper reason for each of those items, you can easily be destroyed with it. Are you with me? I don't have all the time to go through the paper, but I would like to, first of all, in a few minutes, summarize for you what is it, what's technology all about? And when we first did this seminar back in Nigeria, I took time to explain the development of technology and how it got to this point. We don't have that luxury of time today, and luckily, we have the DVD here if you are interested. We could get it across to you. And in any case, the history of that technological development is in the paper that you will be given at a point. I will, I will tell you when the paper will be given to you. I hope you are listening to me. Open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 1. And we are going to read a very popular passage, and I am going to speak very quickly about it, and then we will move on. Are you in Genesis chapter 1? I want you to go down to verse 20. Genesis chapter 1, beg your pardon. And go right down to verse. Let's start reading from verse 24. Are you there with me? Now, in any case, you know that Genesis chapter 1 is the creation chapter. When God created everything there is. Verse 24 And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing. And beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, and after our likeness, I'm reading verse 26. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and do what? And subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every heart, every heart bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for me. Permit me to stop there. Now, when God created man and put him on the earth, God gave man instructions. Part of the instructions that he gave him, we can summarize, he said, be fruitful and do what? Multiply and replenish, refill, fill the whole place. But then he didn't end this instruction before he said, and subdue it, conquer it, make it subject to yourself. Are you listening to me? He said, be fruitful, yes, give back, replenish the earth, fill your place, populate the, the towns, remove all the bushes and fill it with human beings. But then he said, subdue the earth. Now, it is in the process of subduing the earth, when man got into his environment, he started to explore his environment. What is in the environment? If I am meant to subdue, if I am meant to conquer, if I am meant to make it to serve my interests, I will have to know what is there in the environment. You know that man was placed on the earth as God's representative. He was the one that was supposed to take charge and act on God's behalf. So in order to carry out his assignment, man decided or man discovered that he will have to make where he is living conducive for himself, make it serve its own purpose, and make it fulfill whatever man wanted to achieve. Are you listening to me? Now, there's not, nothing wrong with that. Where the problem came was in chapter 3, when sin came in, and man was separated from God. A man was no longer serving as God's representative. He was no longer carrying out God's instruction. He started carrying out his own instruction. That's where the problem came. Are you following what I'm saying? But now, you know, if, this, if chapter 3 didn't happen the way it did, if there was no sin, if there was no separation between God and man, man would have been exploring his environment, subduing it, and making it to serve the interest of God, which he is standing as a representative. Are you following me to that point? But when there was a separation between God and man, and God cut off, where man was the one who cut off with sin, and man began to now do his own will, he ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and he decided, I know what is good for myself. I don't have to recall to God again. I will do what I like. Now, even though he is separated from God, God did not withdraw the commission to subdue the earth from him. Are you following me? He still had the ability as somebody who was made in the, in the image of God. He had that let's call it creative ability, a little bit of it. He could look at something and think through it and put things together and make it serve its own interests. The problem was he was no longer fronting for God. He was no longer serving God's interest. Have you followed me to that point? So technology, what we call technological advancement, is simply man trying to carry out that first commission that God gave him. Of course, we kept giving back to children. 
Sin didn't stop that. We kept multiplying. Sin didn't stop that. We kept administering our environment. Sin didn't stop that. So, even the issue of subduing the act, sin did not stop it. The only problem is that sin corrupted it. It was no longer serving the interests of God. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Now, so, what, what we call technology is man exploring his environment. And I, I gave a little illustration. Now, look at this place now. Where you are in South Africa here is very different from where I come from in Nigeria. In Nigeria, it's hot. Most of the temperatures hardly go below, except for places like Joss, where temperatures can come down as low as 10 degrees. Majority of the year, I am living in 20, 25, and I go right up to 30, 30 degrees, 38 degrees. Now, so the situation in Nigeria is different from here. In Nigeria, the problem I have is problem of heat. So the first thing I'm sure they must have done is when it got hot, man must have taken a piece of paper and done like this. But then he discovered that after doing this for a long time, his hand was paining him. So he said, ah, Maybe the first thought is to call his little child and say, hey, come, take a piece of paper and find daddy. But after some time, even Sonny boy was tired. So the boy said that, the man said, there must be a better way than that. So maybe, I don't know what the first thing, maybe they created the first, like a farm, to farm himself. After that, he decided, what if I automate this? That's how they farm came into existence. But the man that is living in South Africa, for example, does not need a farm. Do you need a farm? No, not at all. What you need is actually something to do what? To heat your... You can see, look at the whole of this hall. It's unthinkable to have a hall of this size in Nigeria. You see fans everywhere. But fans are useless for you. What you need is to get away heat. So, it's only when I came to South Africa that I started seeing this kind of portable heaters, something you plug, and instead of blowing cold air, it's blowing what? Hot. I said, wow, give me a break. I've never seen this kind of thing before. Now, it's, that is man responding to his environment and conquering it and subduing it, and making it to serve its own interests. Don't forget that I keep telling you that the problem is that man was separated from God. Now, so, technology and all inventions, there is nothing wrong with it. Are you with me? It is the legitimate instinct inside of man to explore his environment, subdue it, and make it to serve its own interests. So, look at me now. I'm holding a microphone. When I was growing up, I saw microphones. Let me even not trace all the, all the, the history of how they must have made a microphone. Of course, in the days of Jesus, when he preached to 5,000, I've wondered many times how he did it. But when I started learning physics, I knew he must have used the principle of resonation. That's why most of the time he, he preached by the sea. And he used the, the sea waves as amplification for his voice. Now, that was Jesus. He had all that wisdom, and he could do that. <laughs> At that time, nobody knew anything about physics. Nobody knew what he was doing. But as they kept studying and studying and studying, they said, well, we don't want to keep carrying every crowd that we want to talk to or carry them by the seaside in order to talk to a crowd. We want to talk to a crowd here. And yet we want everybody to hear me and I don't want to be shouting and screaming. So somebody sat down and began to think until they discovered how to connect wires together and pass electricity into it. A long story. Are you with me? But you see, when I was growing up, all I knew were these wired mats. And I got into technology 
technical things quite early. I just had a knack for technical things, and I like to be around it. One of the troubles of recording is that when we are talking, you'll be hearing ah, 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 on the floor, this wire scratching the floor. The microphone itself will pick the sound and it will record it. And it always makes so much ugly, ugly sound. And I'm sure somebody must have sat down, just like you are sitting down. You are listening to the message as I'm listening, but somebody is thinking, why can't we eliminate that wire? That wire is a nuisance. And I have seen preachers fall because they stepped on the wire. Somebody has said, let's eliminate that wire. And so you see, that's how technology developed. As we sat down here, somebody came here and looked at what we were doing and said, oh, things would have been easier if we did this. If we did that. And then they went back, subdued and conquered the environment until they solved problem after problem. Do you understand me to this point? Now, why I'm saying this to you is that there are two extremes that you can see when it comes to technology. Those of us who grew up spiritual and we love the Lord, we just wanted to serve God, we just want to follow Him. Every time there is a new invention, the first response is that spiritual people run away from technology. Hello? Now, I know you were, not, you were not born at that time. But there was a time that people who were spiritual never owned a television